Welcome, welcome. We'll be with you in just under a minute. Grab your coffee and we're about to get started. Thanks for being here. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon. It's shortly after noon on the East Coast, December 13th, 2023, uh, 9 a.m. on the West Coast of the United States. I'm Bill Bimel, and thank you for joining a live taping of another episode of the Win Win webinar series. Uh, if you're here live with us today, thank you for being here. Uh, we have a Q&A button below, and at any, any time in the next hour, if you have questions for Camille or myself, click the Q&A and we'll try to get to you. If you're watching a replay of this episode uh, or are listening to the audio replay on my podcast, uh, The Real Estate Lowdown, please look up our future schedule and, and consider joining us live in the studio for these quarterly uh, webinars surrounding the real estate market. Uh, I am honored to say I have returning champion and longtime friend uh, Camille Holmesy with me here today. And I know a lot of the folks here joining this morning are friends of yours or that know you or have seen you on a previous, uh, one of our previous conversations, but it's always a joy to be with you, my friend. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much, Bill. Very kind of you. Uh, happy to be here one more time, even though it's against your policy. I believe your policy <laughs> is only to invite one one guest one time. That's so, <laughs> well, thank you very much. I am flattered. Uh, Camille Homsey, the GRC Investment Group CEO. Uh, we are a single family office located in Dubai. We are global investors with focus on alternatives. Uh, uh, we are heavyweight on commercial real estate, on uh, 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 alternative energy uh, research development up to implementation, and also on waste management. Um, I champion a campaign for uh, ESG and also for the uh, implementation of its standards as a tool in order to create a measurable impact. Happy to be here. And I like to leave with the note that Bill and I, we are never pre-scripted. That's we right. Never, and this is this is a word of honor. Yes. Uh, we, never, <laughs> we never exchange questions. Even when we have pre-panel discussions, we just discuss the topic in general. What should we share with the right. audience based on the current affair? Happy to be here. Yes. And it really does give that uh, that authentic conversational aspect to what we do. As a matter of fact, I've, I've actually shared on my podcast recordings of your and my private meetings about the preparation for these webinars. Uh, you know, one of the things you obviously, I love you because you're a world traveler, because you invest in, in, um, in all types of investments on a global scale. And especially when it comes to real estate here in the U.S. and our investment at First Lean Capital in the mortgage market, whether that's residential or commercial, a lot of that plays a lot of what plays a role in that is what's going on in the world and what's going on with the cost of money and capital markets. And what I think what's what's key to our friendship that I most adore is that we don't always see eye to eye politically, Camille, and yet we have, there's so much that we do agree on. A majority of, of how to treat people, how to act in business, the way, to, the way to look at business, the way I think we both see government interference as a problem in many regards. So, you know, and, and it's, it's just, 
it's not the way the world is today, right? You know, I think that's the start of the conversation is on a global scale, coming into the end of 2023, we're at a time where we are more seem to me in my 40, I just turned 48 a few days ago. In my 48 years in this in this globe, I don't know a time where the world is more polarized. What are your thoughts on that? First of all, happy birthday and many more years to come in health, Thank in you, health and in prosperity. Um, it, look, uh, 2020 has been a turning point in in our lives. And I am happy that I am living during this era to, wa to watch this turnaround. I mean, it's like a segue. Since beginning of 2020, COVID created in my mind a list that when I wake up, I say to my to my colleagues, to people in my office, I tell them I live by a whole list of words that are opened with the letter C, starting with COVID, mm. then then with capital, mm -hmm. the cost of capital, the changes of the structure of capital, and then then the climate, because the climate is an mm. issue. Then we have conflict, then we have consumer confidence and consumer spending. And then you can you can run the list. I don't want to wear I don't want to wear out the audience with my semantics. But just just starting with this short list, create a lot of uncertainty and also create curiosity. Is where are we going with this? Mm -hmm. The world. You are right. The world is fragmented. A lot of alliances today, regional alliances, alliances we are seeing. A lot of new ideas that were spoken of in the past, and now they came to the forefront, especially the alienation of certain countries that now they are creating a new political and economic body that they're calling it BRICS, and they are powerful. They are mm -hmm. more financed and more capitalized than the G7. The G7 that are setting the rules of the world are less capitalized than the countries of BRICS. Uh, the, the, the G7, the United States, the Europeans, and also Japan, they are laden with debt. Many countries in, in within the G7, they passed, at least four countries, they passed the 100% uh, debt, debt to GDP in their own country. Mm. Several countries are lining up, teetering almost there. The only country that I, I looked recently or recently is like this past week is really Germany, which passed also the 60 percent wow. level that we economists and also the European Union central bank set as the threshold that if you if you pass it, then you are in the in the red zone. Germany today is around 68.1. Every other country is above that. Portugal, Italy and uh, 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 what was our country? Uh, Port uh, Port Portugal, Italy, and there is one more country that they already they already passed the one. Oh, Greece! Sorry, I mean who would forget Greece was yeah. the first one that opened That's the topic. Right. <laughs> uh, 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 they already over a hundred, and there is no way economically that they can reduce that. So many ask me, Camille, what do you think will happen if all those countries? are above 100, what's going to happen? Would the US dollar remain to be the dominating currency or you know reserve currency of the world as it is today? I assure them by saying that for many years to come and in my lifetime, the US dollar will remain to be because that system created in 1971 will persist for many years to come and mm -hmm. to disengage from it or to partner the world economic activities with it is going to take a very long time. Even though China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, and India today, and many countries have put applications to join Brexit, uh, BRICS are already uh, expressing interest in be becoming independent from the U.S. dollar, mm. meaning that we 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 can't keep we can't continue to let the uh, Central Bank of London, European Union, and the U.S. Fed to continue valuating our currency, uh, valuating our credit rating, and also subjecting us to convert our debts into dollar before we pay back 
while you in the West, European and American, have the printing machine that Bill and I will love to have a smaller version of it. And so everyone in our in our audience, so we can right. produce a little bit of our so we can go party. I love the seeds. By the way, I, you've sent me on a new thing, especially with Christmas on the way and Hanukkah spelled with the C. <laughs> I am totally into this whole, I'm going to live the rest of December as my month of C's. And, and capital obviously being the most important of those to me, at least for now. Uh, and so at least in the, in the space of this conversation. Um, and you really bring up a good point, this BRICS organization, uh, which is a move to not use the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, has been in the works for a few years. Those that know about it are are worried about it, and they're mostly the guys that are super worried about it. It is a, something that is real and will continue, and you are right you know, in our lifetime, it's not like all of a sudden tomorrow the U.S. dollar loses, you know, d gets devalued. De uh, and I mean, now there are other issues in play that we can still talk about. Um, inflation being uh, still a consideration. We'll get into that. You know, as we discuss capital on a macro level, why don't we take a trip around the world? You, you've already mentioned Europe. And and uh, very interesting. And when you say a hundred percent, what do you? What are the? What's the the denominator and denominator? Is that is that a hundred percent of the debt payments are equal to GDP, or is it? Is it, what what is the? How are you calculating that that calculation? Uh, take for example, Greece, Japan are over a hundred and fifty percent, meaning I mean over two hundred uh, Greece. Um, meaning that the output of the country, which is the GDP or the GNP, which is the gross national product, meaning even for the companies that are on uh, operate on a global on a global platform, uh, 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 when 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 your debt exceed that line, then you are I mean you are spending more than you are earning. Right. right. So you're just like in our mortgage business in yours and mine, the debt to income. When right. the debt to income diminishes or hinders your ability to repay, I mean, Dodd-Frank is going to jump on your neck. Right. It's the equivalent of a debt service coverage ratio. Exactly. For the, for, exactly. For the, for so the country. Those, right. those, those covenants will be breached to, to, to no return. And that's where many of those countries in their irresponsible spending. And that when I say those countries, uh, including our country. Our country too. The United States of America where we are going back to Jerome Powell and saying, print more, print more. We need to do this, we need to do that. While they are not doing their fiscal job, which we're gonna talk about them when we yeah. talk about the US economy. Yeah. But back to, your, back to your question, in economics, we normally bring the, uh, break the, 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 the world into regions. And today, the most industrial region is, is Southeast Asia. Those that are with the BRICS and those who are neutral and those who are independent and they do not favor BRICS. They don't say we are with the West. They just say like South Korea, like Taiwan, like uh, Australia is 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 with the with the European Union. Uh, <clears throat> meaning in 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 alliances, uh, the the every region, if we are to name them, we take Asia Pacific as a one body, and then we take. <clears throat> We take the Middle East and Central Asia, the countries, the Uzbekistan, the Azerbaijan, the all those countries, uh, Georgia and many others. And then we take the Sub-Sahara in, in Africa, where we heard about the coup d'etats of Gabon, of Cameroon, of Mali, and of the now the Europeans are in danger where all their factories cannot be fueled with <coughs> With uranium, with cobalt, with uh, with lithium, with with a lot of those uh, rare earth resources that they've been buying it for cheap or for nothing, and all of a sudden today they have to pay for it market price. How would that affect the operations, and how would that affect the livelihood, day to day, cost of living for the European citizen? 
which we can touch on again if we have seven hours today <laughs> you and I to discuss with few sandwiches in between. The and then and then we go to the Western Hemisphere, meaning right. South, South America and Canada. We 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 completely separate Canada, Mexico from the United States <clears throat> as a North America because United States and China they are the two big. I, I call them I call them elephants. I, they are not a gorilla, but they, they they're huge, yeah. and they are really today <laughs> the two factors that are shaking the world. Right. So every region that I mentioned has been impacted heavily by COVID, mm. and also by the rising interest rate in the United States, which was a policy in order to contain inflation. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, the world is the world is recovering. Now, Southeast Asia is recovering because also they had the finance, they had China by them, <clears throat> excuse me, and they also had access to the vaccine, and they had access to liquid, so they can supply uh, 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 the the uh, masks and the gloves and the the uh, sanitizers and all other precautions to their citizens. While in Africa till today, we do have a, a short list of countries, they never had access to the vaccine. Wow. Yes, they did not, for, for several reasons. One reason is the United Nations designated India to be the manufacturer licensed of the, uh, uh, the Zeneca and of Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer and the other one. Oh, I did not the, know that. Right. So uh, India was hit twice and they closed the economy for almost eight weeks. And, you know, in a country of 1.4, 1.4, 1, 1 billion, 400 million people closed down the economy, supply chain is heavily impacted. So India was producing vaccine for its own people. So the mm -hmm. African countries designated and some of the South American countries, they were on a waiting list. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the three rating agencies in the United States, they downgraded the rating, the credit rating of many countries at the beginning of COVID, which is something not much of our, God bless it, our mainstream media that became a joke of the world, uh, uh, never even bothered to mention. Because mm -hmm. what that mean, what that mean, as you and I know, it, it hinders the ability of those countries to pay their existing debts and to ask the IMF, the World Bank, the Paris Club, and others for more borrowing so they can buy the vaccine and buy those, buy those uh, supplies. So <clears throat> that, that was like a double whammy. I mean, hit them both sides. Right. Until today, they're having a hard time to revive. Uh, uh, as they started, they were hit by the ripple effect of the Russian-Ukrainian war. And what what that meant for them in in creating short supplies of energy, of urea, of fertilizers, so they can't even produce their own wheat, or corn to make bread for the family, which is like the basic element of every house. So uh, South America, again, it was uh, divergent, meaning different countries based on its circumstances and its size, where the Middle East was helped because of the oil production. So the economy did not stop because you don't need to, to taste the fuel or the oil or the crude and also put it on tables, but it's still, they were financially hit and that created a lot of slowdown. That, the, now I jump to the Europeans. The Europeans, the Europeans, most of them, if not all, they were heavily impacted economically by the by what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, again, due to their many years of dependency on minerals, on energy, of all type of energies uh, from, uh, from Russia. So, I mean, who would expect that the big economy, the largest economy, and the, really the backbone of the European economy, which is Germany, to six months ago to go into a recession? Hmm. I mean, for Germany to go into a recession, it's not only because of the war, it's also because of the bad immigration policies that were created during the tenure of the, 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 the last tenure, tenure term 
of Angela Merkel, where she opened the borders and she said, everybody is welcome. Well, we say for many reasons, I mean, we, I mean, people in the Middle East, they say, well, because the Germans are not making enough babies, they need outside labor. They need skilled labor, which is true, but not to open borders. And, you know, that open borders will later <laughs> make us talk about another open border that's not far away from us. So uh, uh, th those are bad policies that also caused the European countries to be suffering today economically, paying high prices and not affordable for their people of energy. In addition to what I mentioned earlier about the changes in Africa, uh, uh, and and that that will limit the supplies of of a lot of minerals that that fuel the the industrial the industrial machine of Europe. Leaving can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Let's go back to Asia for a minute because we know Europe has its own set of issues, and a lot of that, you know, there's both economic and political unrest amongst the European countries. But you, I want to, I don't want to step over Asia because it seems like you know China being the big dog there. Um, where is their economy at right now? Is I I, I think that there's um, the, you know, for a while they, you know, they still have growth, but I think they're, it's always like, oh, well, if they have less growth, that's actually really bad. Or where is it? Where's China? And then where is that comparative to some of those other Asian countries? I he heard Africa's in Europe are in trouble, but how, where is the state of China right now going into 2024? Bill, China was hit by two, two major headwinds. Mm -hmm. One of them is COVID hit them twice. The second one was even stronger than the first one. So the government came to a standstill, which they called the zero tolerance. They closed the economy completely. That not only hurt the economy of China, the people of China, but that also uh, 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 disrupted the supply chain of the entire world. And we know, I mean, we don't have to go far, go into, go right. into Walmart. Go into Walmart. Everything inside, including the cash registers, including the tile on the floor, including the lighting illumination devices, and everything on the shelves is made yep. in China. And Walmart has, we know, 2.2 million people working there. So we don't want we don't want that to be disrupted. The second one, the second one was uh, the fact that the due to change of policies and to the pro, protracted war of Ukraine and Russia, it, it, it cleared completely to the West that China is an, is an ally of Russia. So, uh, so immediately, United States and the Europeans, they changed policies toward importing and relying on China as a source of a lot of, a lot of the supply chain that, that they need to, for, for their economy. Opening up to other countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, right. and Thailand and many others, they will take some time in because they are not scalable to compete with China. So China was hit with second, and then they had a major internal oversupply of real estate in the country. Ah, that's Those countries, if you remember, we, I think we spoke about this in one episode in the past, those, those companies, they were all financed by government subsidiaries. They call them banks. We call them the China government. Right. Because you know, China, at the end of the day, you think Ernst & Young and KPMG are going there to audit? Right. Nobody can, nobody can right. audit. Right. What they tell you, you take for face value. So uh, 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 their, <laughs> their accounting is cooked all the way. Right. So uh, uh, that created another problem of oversupply you know there are there are provinces in China where they are knocking down high rises because oh, wow. they are never occupied. Yes. You so know, that and, that that's still going on. I remember we did report on that two years ago or something here when we looked at some of those ghost towns. Are they they're actually going and knocking them down? I guess that's another way to put people back to work, right? <laughs> go go demolish the empty buildings. You just put them to work to build something. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Absolutely right. I mean, China now is is back to a growth rate of about 4.6 to 5. 
the last two times you and I spoke, they were between seven and nine percent. So it's bad for them then. Oh, it's it's like they dropped like fifty percent, and they are not out of it. So their current government, they are aware of this. And look, China is not a country that is going to go by the wayside of course and so. thrown in the trenches. No, it is they they restructuring their economy completely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know them; they do things quietly. And in the past, we called them the turtle. And that turtle works slowly, right. but effectively. So, uh, uh, and so it know, sounds he, like the beneficiary of of some of that of the geopolitical aspects of our relationship with the West with China is that the other Asian nations, true. Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, are all the beneficiaries of some of that additional. Uh, the, so, you know, we're seeing some shift of, of, of into those markets. So that's good to know. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll make sure I let the Vietnamese know that when I visit there. Well, <laughs> if you want, if you want to see, if you want to see an example of that in North Carolina, the government is now in, in partnership with a conglomerate from Vietnam to manufacture EV vehicles oh, and okay. also agricultural equipment in North Carolina with with 50-50 is the Perry Pursu capital. So imagine Vietnam, the country that when I was growing up as a child, I mean, we saw bombings and Viet Cong and Nepal. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing Vietnam, the country. I mean, I've been in Saigon about 2019. Yeah. I mean, you see high rises. You don't see the black and white that we saw in the 60s and 70s. So this is one of the beneficiaries, Indonesia, that definitely a country of 265 million people and about like 3,000 yeah. islands. Uh, they are they are also on a on a short list to back up what we what China will be given up. So China now, just to close on China, they are focusing on heavy equipment and mm. also maintaining the leadership in EV production. China today produce more electric vehicles than all the other countries collectively. Wow. I mean, when I I mean, I, I just came from the from a long trip to Asia and the Middle East, and I see brands and I tell the driver, what kind of car is this? Oh, this is from Korea. Oh, this is from China. And that one, oh, that one is also from China. Like wow. acronym names, QIS is a, is a brand. He said, oh, this one is Uber. Uber drivers love it. I'm not saying superior, but they are definitely less costly wow. than Tesla, than Benz, than Audi, than Volkswagen and Toyota. Hmm. Good to know. That's okay. very good. Um, okay, good. So let's shift out of Asia and come back to the West and talk about North America. First of all, before we jump into North America, in the last few weeks, there's been huge news in Argentina. And I wanted to give a shout out to my Argentinian friends. And I, I actually spent Christmas in Buenos Aires last year, uh, my first time ever in Argentina. But it was a quite an interesting experience. A year ago, there's like two markets for money. There's like, you know, three markets for money. There's cash markets. There's credit markets. Literally on, you go into, and my experience of being in a Buenos Aires was you, you'd actually have two prices for everything, a cash and a, and uh, and there actually three American dollars, uh, credit cards, and Argentinian pesos. You know, so. Um, but you know, do you have any quick updates for the world on what's going on in Argentina, and then we'll move to the north. Beautiful, great question, Bill. I'm like you. I've been several times in Argentina, and also I have immediate family, brothers of my dad, and first cousins that live in the north in the region of Tucumán. The uh, uh, Last week we were we were in Miami during Art Basel, mm -hmm. and you know wherever I am around and people gather in a big table and th these same questions, you know, come up. And I told them I said, look, it's great that this president is an economist, but the best leader is an entrepreneur that hire economists. I will be concerned if an economist think that I am self centered. I know that all, I belong to the following theory and I'm going to do the following. I prefer when we are to make a transition is to use diplomacy and to be and to be 
more of statesmen and statewomen, if, if, if there is a term, to, 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 to take the country through transition after 50 or 60 years since Juan Perón, since socialism was imported into that beautiful country called Argentina. Argentina is not only Maradona and Messi and Saka. Okay. It's a great country. It's a fertile country. It has resources underground. Like I said, fertile. I mean, wine, Mendoza, we all know about this. Definitely the cattle. They are the, the one of the largest cattle exporters to the right. world. And their cart and their cattle, by the way, most of it graze on grass. Mm -hmm. They are not, you know, fed corn and fed right. soya and all that stuff. So, so their quality even superior. But there has been, you know, with socialism come, comes corruption and comes centralized government where the people are just like, you know, Monday to Friday and no hope and no future. So uh, this guy came in and he said he want to dollarize the country, which I prefer, again, the transition. Poland tried that and it is still today testing it. So it's almost like close to 10 years. So right. they still have, in Poland, they have the zloty and they have the dollar. And a retailer, when you and I stop there to buy whatever chattel that we need to buy, they have a calculator and they say, this is the conversion rate. You can pay by euro, you can pay right. by zloty. I prefer that for him, the economist. The second thing the economist said that, again, it worked counter counterproductive for for uh, uh, a transition is from day one, he said, I am not going to, to join uh, BRICS. Like you don't have to say it. Korea didn't say it, <laughs> you know, Thailand didn't say it. Right. And Malaysia didn't say it. And most of the uh, uh, oil producing countries in the Middle East, they didn't say it. Mm -hmm. They said, we're gonna do business with both. Right. So Algeria today who favor France with the, with the BRICS, uh, but they also are now the main supplier of oil to Western Europe mm -hmm. because of the proximity to replace Russia. So, but they are also good friends with Russia mm -hmm. and with Ukraine. I I prefer for countries that are not the head of the polarity to play the card on both ends because they have to take their people from underdeveloping, developing to developed. Right. You know, and that's what I ask of the leader of Argentina. We can talk about Argentina for a whole hour, yeah. but I hope this answered. I think he is rushing the matter yeah. of aligning the country where the country need every friend possible yeah. to make the transition successful. That's all. Yeah, he's he's uh, the so the 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 idea being severe austerity. They're cutting back on on um, on government subsidies, basically. Uh, and we'll see what happens there. So keep an eye on that for those that we just wanted to, you know, bring that up because it's something for everyone to watch that. Let's go ahead and move over into the North America. And the most important thing is we want to talk about uh, commercial real estate in North America and the U.S. And that's what we'll spend the rest of this this hour doing. Um, do you want to you want to talk at first about capital markets here in the U.S., bringing it full scale, knowing that the dollar is the reserve currency and where we are today compared to, you know, a year ago? I mean, definitely a great question, Bill. And it is time to talk about the United States because at the end of the day, we live here and we raise our grandchildren over here. The, uh, <coughs> excuse me. The United the States, children, like, by the like, way, are always the easier, the the better ones, right? Those are the easier <laughs> ones. The grand. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, true, true. The the United States, like everywhere else, we were hit suddenly by COVID with no knowledge, with no uh, preparation. We didn't have vaccine. We didn't have we didn't have ventilators. We, we did not have specialists. We did not know. We were just like you know, in a goose chase, running from one side to the other, not knowing, flipping on decisions, flipping on opinions. And uh, uh, it the, there were rough days. After COVID, we had the enforcement of the vaccine and then, and the resistance. And then we were hit by the in inflation uh, that was again, 
people know that it was the 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 premature decision to completely come across in policy against fossil fuel okay as as it is the core of of of, of every economy no ship is going to cross the ocean no no house will be heated no plane will fly without fossil fuel so we can we i believe in transition i believe in green and clean clean energy before we reach green energy mm -hmm. but uh, it seems that the people in washington they came up with different ideas that are not smart ideas that caused inflation in the world well the printing so that, of, of three trillion dollars and handing that cash out to every american or that wanted it was really i mean and it's really six trillion when you when you when you really add it all up but it's the printing of money that we've talked about over and over again right true, and, true. i mean i mean not only one administration because covid covid had survived the last year of the previous administration and then the new administration. So it's not like one of them is, is exonerated innocent. No. No, both, both of them, administrations, yeah. Both of them, they made major, major economic mistakes. And I the only way I can think of them is that they have no ears. Because when you are in leadership, the true leader is the one who listens. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> then based on narrowing the consulting, mm -hmm. You come up, you come up with the right decision and take responsibility for it. But these guys, they came in and just like randomly, you know, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'll do that, I will do this to reverse what he said, what she said. A lot of reactionary action. Meanwhile, we are in a country today, we are reaching 340 million people. You work for us, you don't work to despise Mr. X and Mr. X to Mr. Y. But Again, that's again a long conversation that need that that one need three days. So, uh, so we uh, uh, then after that, I mean, Jerome Powell as the I always call call him by the name because I uh, not too long ago I said he is the victim of the Congress and someone said no he is not he is also a bad economist. I don't think so. But uh, 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 central banking in the United States was created by Congress. It's very important for the audience to know that. This is when, the when they tell us in school that they are two separate independent entities, no. One is the son of another. And through the history, through the 20th century, the central bank that we call the Fed Reserve, they were, they were revised, they were restructured twice. So by whom? By the Congress. So when the Congress decide, decide on irresponsible spending, printing programs that do not make sense, okay, and while their duty is to serve and create programs for their constituents, the ones who voted for them and the ones who did not vote for them, that is democracy. So uh, by not doing that, they go to Jerome Powell and say print. So that, that separation or that disconnect between monetary policy and fiscal policy is what created where we are today. Mm. An outcome of that was the failure of the banks, starting with uh, 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 Silicon Valley Bank and then Signature and then First, First Republic. Well, okay, they were mismanaging their banks, but where is the, where is the government? Where is the regulator? Where is right. the auditor? How often do you check their books to see if their reserve, if their lending, if, if the investments that they are making are in line with protecting the interest of the consumer who is you and I? And all that led us to where we are. Today we are we are now we are now we are dealing with court cases of people that were negatively impacted by those vaccines. And now Pfizer and others and the others, Moderna and uh, Johnson and Johnson saying, "Yeah, you're right. We rushed it, but uh, 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 you signed a disclaimer. You did sign a disclaimer when you took the vaccine, so you cannot sue us because the government protect us." A lot of things happening today, and at a point where we have now a strategic things happening in 2024 called the election. Ah, okay. This is. This is going to be. Get your me, popcorn ready. You know, I say to them, <laughs> you know, one one is fighting out of court, but he is leading wherever I go, 
And then the other ones are fighting afraid them and their backers from him coming back. And this is reality. We know who are the two candidates. Right. You know, right. we know that the yeah. incumbent is the incumbent want to run, even though some of our good friends in, in certain in, in recent interviews I saw on TV, people that you and I know in the business, they said we suggest for the old man to step aside and leave yep. with the legacy because he has the lowest rating. Since I think, God knows, since 500 years ago, this guy, I mean, him and his administration doing a lousy job. I'm you just never know what's going to happen on either side. I guess maybe there's some rabbit that gets pulled out of a hat. The problem is, is last year when we talked about this, there was one war in Ukraine, right? And that obviously isn't going away. Now there's two wars in <laughs> going on. And... um and then we've got an election year coming. What's the effects potentially on our, I mean, what, what, let's try to, rather than try to agnosticate and prognosticate to what will happen in po politically, what will be the effects on the economy? What is the government going to do or not do? And what's going to happen in the economy as it relates to real estate too? I mean, is there more signature bank coming? More of these, more failures coming? You mentioned you 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 pointed that out the, brilliantly. That you know the that I know from for personal conversations with you know people that work for the federal government that no one saw those bank failures coming last spring. You had Signature Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, and First Republic, two of the law two or three of the largest failures in U.S. history. And when a bank fails, more often than not, the regulators know 60 days ahead of time. Nothing, none of that was true with those banks that failed last spring. What are the potential, I mean, what, you know, what could potentially be on the horizon here when it comes to banking, capital markets, and real estate? Uh, uh, your question is well-packed. So uh, <laughs> we only have you know, another uh, 17 simple, minutes, Camille. So let's speak. <laughs> in, 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 in a simple example, when two kids fight in school, we don't go to the other parents. We go to the principals and say, have you been watching what the kids are doing in the backyard? Are you watching those fist fights? Now, when, when the banks fail, I hold the government and the agencies that regulate banking, I hold them responsible. I say, you did not maintain oversight. You're getting paid for oversight. You're getting raises for oversight. You have pensions and you have benefits and you have secure jobs to maintain oversight. You were not doing your job. You did not protect the public, not right. in California, not in New York, not elsewhere. Bill and I, we know the numbers. We know how much was left that was not even taken by Flagstar Bank from, yep. from, from Signature and others. And the news, every every media had put it in their on their on their headline. But going back, I did not mention the war in the Middle East because if there is a big problem in the world today, it's what's happening in the Middle East. Whatever is the outcome, okay? A lot of changes are going to happen in a lot of different governments in the world, not only in the Middle East, is because it's becoming a humanitarian thing. Where is leadership, okay? Where is leadership that will come in for reconciliation? I'm not saying forgive the assailant. I'm not saying forgive, exonerate the person who created a mistake or made the, 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 the Israel side, the Palestinian side, it doesn't matter. Who came as a leader? to say, hey guys, we have to come up with a solution permanent right. to protect every child, to protect every woman, to protect every soldier from this happening again. And just enjoy life because what is going on is not acceptable yeah. for everybody. We now, talked so about what it, you know, was I mean that you know that's obviously not a topic that we can even get into today. But... No, no, we can't because <laughs> it is, it is so you... complex. Yeah. It's so complicated. It's the be best best not to talk about it. Today. Yeah, well, you you, uh, but, you made the one good point, which is leadership on both sides or needs to be 
You know, absolutely, it, you know. absolutely. How would that how would that impact the uh, economy here in the U.S.? And then we're going to stop to talk about commercial real estate in the next fifteen minutes. The uh, uh, the war in Ukraine created a, an appetite for investors from all over the world to migrate to the United States. That increased the valuation of the U.S. dollar in the forex market, in the currency market. But that has a negative impact on exporting countries because now we have to adjust the valuation of our products when we send it to America. So when you see mm. a, a product that's a piece of vegetable that is not in season at Costco, I like to always go down with my examples to the street to be yeah. realistic. You know, when you see that avocado, you say, well, it was three, four, two dollars a year ago. How come now they are like one for two dollars? Well, because this is imported. The exporting country that they import from the U.S., they have to pay more for what they import because of the new valuation of their money. Their money did not change in their in value. Their reserve did not change. But the demand for the U.S. dollar increased the valuation and the demand on the U.S. dollar. And it is not, it's not a simple formula, right. but the US, the U.S. consumer will pay for it. You will hear on the news, and it could be true, that the inflation today came down from 8.6, I think, at the highest. Now it is around 3.9, between 3.9 and 4.1. That can be true. Now, the unemployment numbers are a big question because there are factors considered and factors not considered. You know the cyclical, non-cyclical, part-time, uh, the the ones who left the, the the workforce. All that is a different different conversation. But the inflation is th that increasing the inter uh, interest rate did curtail the inflation growth. Yes, did it did it cause it to recede? Yes, it did recede. Yeah, but was that the only that was that the only a uh, card in the hands of the feds or Jerome Powell? No, because it takes three different departments to maintain that economy. And there is one economy, one department that is never mentioned when it comes to responsibility. We always say monetary and we say fiscal. Fiscal is the Congress, the Senate and the White House and the monetary is the feds. But there is one that the Department of State because the Department of State job job description is not to travel from one, one state to the other to say to this guy, uh, be nice, to the other guy, don't be nice. And say, no, you are, the, you are the trade ambassador that we are a producing country. We are leading industrial country. We are in business not only to consume internally, but also to export to reduce that balance between import-export, which is one of the several vari variables in the formula of calculating GDP. So I don't, again, I don't see them doing their job. Not this, this, not this foreign policy, not the one before and the one before, even before that. When the one, the one who did, the one who was the head of the uh, uh, foreign policy during Nixon, he is not the one who created the dollarization of the world. It was the other guys, Robert, you know, McNamara, okay. Spiro Agnew, and the others. And uh, foreign policy with monetary and fiscal must we they must hold themselves responsible to bring this economy to where it should be. Does the mark does that shift in cost of capital, the U.S. dollar, also? How does that play co convert to real estate purchases? Because, you know, we've obviously seen Florida still going through the roof. You know, for a long time, Florida was held up by um, uh, uh, by the foreign buyers uh, who kind of went away in the last couple of years because of you know both administrations kind of shooing them away for different reasons. But obviously, Florida internally benefited from COVID and everyone. So, you know, where do, what's the effect? We got to spend the last 10 minutes talking just about real estate here. <laughs> I agree with you. So where, what are you seeing? Where are you seeing the opportunities? Where are you seeing the cracks? Where are you investing in real estate? Are you selling real estate? What's the, because what's the, what, what's, what's all of this? 
what's the effect for those that want you know that are looking at the next 2024 whether from an investor's point of view or what to expect from an opportunity point of view bill uh, uh, from uh, 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 from a foreign investor perspective we are a long we are a long term long haul capital preservation and growth so we are not sellers and we invest in the united states to maintain uh, a legacy and also for a succession and transition for the next generations of the family. And so does every established family or generational family. Oh, but I just want to Trump, interrupt and say that's the golden rule, by the way, for everyone. Uh, buy and never sell is the golden rule in real estate, really. Especially especially, especially in these circumstances or, or in the, like, for example, when I started building the portfolio in the U.S. started in 2010, and some media used to say America, commercial real estate in America is on sale. And we bought everything. The conversation was not what the cap rate, okay? What is the what is the price per square foot? And we compare it to replacement cost. So we say, I bought it 60% below replacement. So if I'm going to build that building, it's going to cost me $300 a square foot. And I bought it for 70 or 80 or $100. Mm. Then I am ahead of the game. So I was buying a bargain. But... Uh, the, the, the impact of the rising valuation of the U.S. dollar created fear in, and, in developing and even, even in industrial countries. I mean, I learned from many different good relationships with law firms that they are registering European, English, and uh, 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 European Union companies or funds here in the U.S. for two reasons. One, because they are afraid of the diminishing valuation of the euro and you remember there was a period when it when when the euro became at par with the us dollar and uh, 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 and then also because of the over regulation that is taking place in europe not only on the finance but also on the reporting on the esg and also on the climate participation and also on the measuring impact measure, measuring impact now Someone from South America, a wealthy, wealthy person that does not believe or understand the valuation or, or to participate in the uh, digital currency as it is a way to protect. Again, it's very volatile and it is, we, we know many reasons not to invest in it. Uh, uh, the best is to go and buy commercial real estate in America. So when they will come to Miami or to Houston and those have been the, always the main destinations or even to Southern California, and, you know, they pay asking price. And sometimes they compete against each other. And we saw that happening. Why? Because they came for different reasons. They are not commercial real estate investors. They are wealthy people coming to protect their assets and their lifetime earning in the United States of America. That, that created that kind of mis mispricing for, of, of, of uh, real estate assets. But if we are to, to cover thoroughly and in, in a short period of time, the four pillars of the commercial real estate, which are retail, industrial, office, and multifamily, we find retail is the one who survived the best mm. among those who were hurt because there are a lot of new brands coming into the market. And mm. because also the a lot of the people that like, you know, over 55, over 65, they're looking for passive income, they look into single tenant. So we saw that happening. So we see that almost every every single tenant brand I know, they are expanding. They are expanding with multiple locations. Okay, I mean, uh, there are some that are reducing. They are reducing in order to, again, to scale, to reduce their exposure, do, but they are increasing their e-commerce. Hmm. You know, some somebody might say Bed, Bed Bath and Beyond is closing a uh, hundred or two hundred. Well, they are expanding elsewhere, and they are owned by a conglomerate that own other brands. So uh, the headlines say something, but the inner uh, uh, contents will say something always different. Uh, the next thing we had a, a, a solid, solid uh, property type, which was the uh, industrial or the warehousing. Again, we see that now. Um, receding a little bit to, to 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 hospitality, and also we see now more people more attracted to data centers and to life science research centers. 
One is because of COVID and because all the internet and the time we spend at home. And then we have more demand. And now every meeting is on Zoom. Every meeting is on Google or on Microsoft. Uh, just like we are doing right now, this is going to some kind of uh, co-location data center that you pay rent for and everything else. Data centers will be interesting to talk about that because we invest in it in Europe and here in the US. And I can speak thoroughly about this from construction all the way to, oh. to uh, co-location and to put it in operations. Then you have the multifamily. Multifamily has been the baby of every investor, of every private lender, if it is a fund or they are a private company, which Bill is one of the leaders in that field. And But uh, right now, uh, Florida in specifically is facing oversupply in certain areas of Florida, and it's going to spread. Central Florida is booming. There's a lot of government uh, investments. Their policies have been favorable and favored by those people who moved from the north in taxes and also in being more entrepreneurial friendly. People did not move there because of COVID, because Florida had COVID, Texas had COVID, everywhere else had COVID. So for those who say, oh, we moved there because of COVID, no, you moved there because of wallet. <laughs> not, because, not because of COVID. I hope I covered everything, but there is something I like to share in numbers, a couple of lines that yes. I read from uh, uh, from NIOP. Now, NIOP, the National Association of Industrial and uh, also Office Park, uh, they say that the combined, they say that the combined economic contribution of, of commercial buildings and commercial assets in the United States exceed, exceed, 20 between 22 to 24 trillion dollars the valuation of commercial real estate they're saying that commercial real estate contribution to the u.s economy it contributed 2.3 trillion to the u.s gross domestic product wow the gdp also second bullet generated 831 billion dollars in personal earning wow and the last thing is it supports 15.2 million jobs. So wow. commercial real estate by itself support 15.2 million jobs, and we are short. Developers are short. We invest into developments. You know, the, the general contractor come to me and say, I can't get enough people. I say, go to the border. He said, those guys, they don't know commercial real estate. <laughs> They're coming to America to get paid. <laughs> They're coming to America to get social security. They are not coming to work. And uh, that's sad. I will stop over here. I know we have, we are under time constraints. Uh, maybe yes. Bill has more questions. Go ahead. I have, well, I really just want to, I think you covered it well. Retail seems resilient and people still want to go socially. There's, retail needs to shift, but in terms of single tam, uh, tenant, drive through or certain types of mixed use, you know, that are for the next generation, I think, you know, you're holding. I think the ish, biggest issue that you bring up with multifamily is um, just the cost of capital. You know, when I looked at multifamily deals uh, the last couple of years, uh, it just was the head scratcher, just like back in 06, when, when I would scratch my head when you know, that $30,000 a year government worker was given a known loan of $1 million on their home. You know, that it was the same kind of head scratching that we did the last couple of years in the multifamily sector when you were going into green and growing markets and, and modeling to a sub five cap on a multifamily deal. And it only penciled out because you had a 3% loan. Well, no, those don't exist anymore. So all that stuff is got is just you know you just got a lot of financial mismatches. A lot of what we what we, we you're going to hear the the magic word I believe you're going to hear is maturity mismatch in the in the commercial That's real the estate one. marketing where you've That's got you've got plenty of good families owning commercial real estate, but you got a lot of guys that have gotten in the game, uh, and those people aren't going to go anywhere. They're going to keep their you know they're going to be fine long term. Um, but there's a there, anyone who's a player who's highly leveraged who has to go refinance 
They're going to come up against a maturity mismatch. 2024, we have to go soon. I have a, my next meeting to go to, and our audience has been patient, but I want one more. You know, I don't finish my webinars without a bold prediction. 2024, what's going to happen? True or not, you can make something up. If it's funny, I'll still I'll still go along with it. What do you what's your prediction? If I agree with the with the with the majority of economists on the term that it is a soft landing in the beginning, maybe six months ago, I called them bad pilots because they do not have a pilot license. How could they know that it is a soft landing? Right. But the time is showing that it will be soft landing for many different factors. Main two factors. One of them is when the cap rate goes up, all the investors were happy. They said, now we're going to buy things at below cost. But when the treasury also climb up, that reduces that spread. Mm. So that, that eliminate that possibility. The second one is the asset owners, they have been warned since the beginning of COVID that, there will be, that this is the end of that trajectory that existed for 12 quarters, if you remember, that we were saying next quarter, no, the next one, uh, normally nine, just like matching baseball. Uh, but then we went to 12. And then COVID is the one who, who, who disrupted everything. It was, not, it was not policy. It was COVID. So if it wasn't for COVID, probably it would have stretched for maybe, I don't know how many more. But uh, COVID made that stop. So since then, and there was a stimulus. So there was a extend and pretend. Mm. So those owners, they've been having a breaks to either secure private capital on that side or to go to investors and say, look, I am willing to accept mark to market. And if you would come with me as a strategic partner, a strategic partner that will come with a check and skill. So if those, if all those factors come to play, that guy is not going to go belly up. He will not mm -hmm. surrender. He will not surrender the keys. But for many, they will, they will because they do not, they do not meet the covenants of their notes. So when the when the DSCR that Bill mentioned before, which is the debt service coverage ratio, it dropped below one. I mean, extend and pretend they accepted banks accepted one, right. even though the covenant before it was a breach, it was 1.25 or 1.3, they accepted one in order to save their stockholders and to save their reputation and their balance sheet. Today, those sellers or those property owners, they are a little bit stronger because they've been securing partners for themselves. The only today disconnect bill is on accepting the mark to market. Right. You know, my property was 100 million and now a current appraisal based on accurate on occupancy and on cost of financing, it's going to be close to 75 million. Right. Not everyone is willing to accept that. So they are sellers in a state of denial. Well, there it is. So for those that took the opportunities that the government has afforded it, the soft landing may be possible. For the rest of us, for the rest of them that are in over their skis, let's get our popcorn ready. 2024 should be exciting. That in an election year. Hey, wow, we're going to have a lot to talk about next year. Thanks for being here. Thanks for another great episode of the Win Win Webinar Series. And I'll see you again in the new year. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, everyone. Have a great day and happy holidays. Happy holidays, my friends.